So uh, just to um, uh, start out, I wanted to get a sense, and maybe it would be useful for the other speakers as well. Uh, how many of you are uh, in high school? We have high school students. Yeah. So a few in high school, and then uh, some uh, are in college. Most are in college. And how about graduate school? Nobody's graduate. Medical school? One hand. Okay. So we, uh, right. So most are in college, but a few in high school and a scattering of, of others. All right. Well, good. So uh, I'm going to talk about my own career. And uh, uh, basically, I am interested in what the brain does. And so I entitled this uh, Pursuing What the Brain Does. And uh, my story actually does begin in high school. So that's, I wanted to. Uh, to uh, start at that particular point. Uh, so in, in and I, I think one of the other themes that I want to uh, talk about is different people and how they can influence you. Uh, because there's a, a series of people that have influenced me in my own career. So uh, in, in high school, one of the courses that I took was a uh, course in psychology. Um, it uh, was a very good course, I thought, uh, taught by someone who might well have been the best teacher at the high school that I went to. Uh, and uh, I enjoyed that uh, course a lot. And one of the things that I did in that course, we, we had to write a term paper at the end. And uh, I wound up uh, writing my term paper about uh, Sigmund Freud. Uh, I, I read a number of uh, the papers that he had written, and uh, I uh, was very interested in a lot of the aspects that, uh, of sort of Freudian psychology and uh, in terms of how the brain was working. Now, I didn't realize at the time, but then we'll uh, perhaps come back to this a little bit later, but uh, Freud was a neurologist. Uh, he got interested in a particular class of uh, patients, and uh, that sort of formed the basis of a lot of his uh, thinking and sort of Freudian psychology. Uh, but we'll, we'll be coming back to that as, as we go along, and um, I'm just going to leave his picture up there for the, for the moment. So uh, uh, when I went to college, uh, uh, after high school, I uh, had this interest in psychology, but I also had interests in uh, mathematics and uh, physics and a variety of things. And I took a seminar in astronomy and got interested in astronomy and uh, majored in astronomy for a year. Um, but uh, then um, we, uh, uh, I, I had this seminar in the cosmological differential equation, uh, which uh, describes the distribution of mass in the universe. And uh, there were a lot of unknowns in that particular equation. And I thought it was sort of nonsensical at the end and decided that it was too far afield from anything that made any sense to me. And uh, I uh, thought back about uh, my interest in the brain, and I suppose uh, was also influenced by the fact that my father was an ophthalmologist, so I knew about medicine. So I thought that it would be, uh, so I shifted from majoring in astronomy to uh, moving to biology with the idea of going in to uh, do medicine with a focus on the brain. And I did take, and then I, uh, stopped taking astronomy courses and uh, took biology courses and even took uh, another course in psychology uh, as, as, a, as a part of what I was doing there. Um, so I, I was pretty sure that that was the right direction to go. Uh, and uh, there, uh, just as another anecdote, one of the things that uh, convinced me that I was in the right direction, I uh, heard a talk actually in the Department of Psychology by a neurologist by the name of Norman Geschwind, who at, at that time was at Boston University. And he told uh, of, of the way that his view about the brain worked in terms of connections that different parts of the brain were sending information around one part to the other. And this was very important in the way the brain worked. And he had uh, a very nice talk, which I probably wound up hearing about 10 times finally in my life. But, 
Uh, he used to give this talk quite a lot, but it was the first time that I had heard it. Um, and uh, the focus was on patients that have this particular disorder called alexia without agraphia. It's a clinical disorder, uh, as Walter was saying, is a lesion in part of the brain. And the question is, how do you explain the deficit that the patients have on the basis of uh, this particular lesion, usually a stroke that happens in these patients? And in this case, uh, alexia is that they can't read, but uh, they don't have agraphia. That is, they can write. And what's curious is that they can write something and then be unable to read what they've just written. And uh, the question is, is how do you explain something bizarre like that? And uh, actually, the, uh, the first case of the way that uh, this could be described was uh, first presented by a neurologist from France by the name of Desjardins uh, in the uh, uh, early 1900s. Uh, but, uh, that had sort of been forgotten for various reasons. And uh, Geshwin uh, brought this back to life again. And he pointed out that uh, these, these patients had a stroke involving the left occipital cortex and the posterior part of the corpus callosum. So visual information could uh, get into the brain, but only into the right hemisphere and because the corpus callosum was also lesion, the information couldn't get over to the left side where the language center is to be able to read. So they couldn't get, so they couldn't read because what, they, what the right brain was seeing couldn't get over to the language center. But the writing centers in the left hemisphere were okay. They were not damaged. They were a little they were further forward. So they could write, but they couldn't read. And it was, uh, so it was a way of explaining what was going on. So I must say that after hearing Geshwin, I uh, said, gee, that, that's, uh, that's really neat. It's sort of explaining how things are working, and I like that. And so I think I'm going off in the right direction. Um, so that sort of helped confirm uh, my, my view of going into medicine with the idea of uh, studying the brain. So uh, I continued to be interested in, in, the, in neuroscience as I uh, did my uh, medical school. And uh, we had two free summers then. And then the first summer I spent uh, uh, with uh, some investigators at Harvard Medical School, uh, fellow man named David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel. Um, these are people that were studying the visual system and uh, they were pretty good investigators who subsequently won the Nobel Prize. Um, so that was, a, that was a very nice experience. And then um, in my second summer, uh, I had the opportunity to work with Norman Geshwin, who uh, was one of the people that had inspired me to go in the right direction uh, anyway. And so I spent a second summer with, uh, with him uh, learning a little bit more about the way that he uh, views the brain to be working. So um, uh, at the end of medical school, um, but uh, yeah, so at, so at the end of medical school, I did my internship and I was ready to go off to neurology. Um, but at that time, we had the Vietnam War going on and there was a mandatory doctor draft. And uh, in the middle of my internship, I got a telegram. Have any of you ever gotten a telegram? Uh, <laughs> I don't think they have telegrams anymore, but in any event, I got a telegram um, from the uh, US Public Health Service um, telling me that I uh, would need to report to the National Institutes of Health on July 1st. Uh, and um, that was a bit of a surprise, but of course it was better than being assigned to go to Vietnam, so I thought that was, it was, it was okay. But I had to call up my residency director. I was, I was going to go to the Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, I had to call uh, Ray Adams and say, I'm sorry, I can't come. Uh, I've, I've just been basically drafted. Uh, and it, in those days, that wasn't uh, uncommon, so it, it wasn't a big surprise. But I, I wound up having to come to the National Institutes of Health. Now, when I came here uh, at that time, I uh, actually um, uh, wound up in a laboratory doing membrane biophysics. 
that was the, that was the job that was available. I also had uh, been studying membrane biophysics, so that was an area that I was also interested in. So I did membrane biophysics for two years. But when I was here as well, uh, there was uh, the opportunity to uh, listen to some other lectures and, uh, that were around NIH at the time. And uh, there were some very good lectures that I heard on motor physiology, uh, the way that the brain makes movement. There, was, uh, there were a number of pioneers who were here at that time. Um, and that in the, the main person running the uh, area of motor physiology was someone by the name of Edward Everts. Uh, he was one of the first people to record from awake primates uh, making movements. Hubel and Weasel were some of the first people to record from awake primates uh, during vision. And Everts was one of the first people to record from primates making movements. So he, uh, he had a big school of people around him. Um, and uh, he was a very, uh, very interesting person. Uh, one of the people who was training with him at that time, who became my friend ever since, is a fellow by the name of Malin DeLong, who was interested particularly in the basal ganglia during movements. Uh, Malin just uh, last year won the Lasker Award, for uh, which sort of began at that time in terms of the work that he was doing in terms of the basal ganglia role in movement. So in any event, um, I finished up. I went back to the Massachusetts General to do my neurology training. And um, uh, I had in the back of my mind that this business about motor control was very interesting because I had been inspired by Everts and a number of the discussions that we had had. And um, after my neurology residency, I took a year in London and uh, studied motor physiology with a person by the name of David Marsden. Uh, uh, Marsden uh, was a very interesting person. Um, he uh, was one of the, turns out to be one of the founders of the subspecialty of neurology called movement disorders. Now that field uh, wasn't really well, the way that knowledge happens, this is, this is important, and this will probably change over your own careers. There's so much information accruing uh, in uh, different areas that uh, it's necessary to subspecialize more and more if you want to know something about anything. Um, so uh, when I went off to do my fellowship, there was no field of movement disorders. There was neurology. People did neurology, and you did the whole thing. But then there became so much knowledge in the individual areas that it began to fragment into different subspecialties. So movement disorders hadn't existed then, but it has appeared. And so I uh, uh, wound up working with him on motor physiology, uh, but uh, it was at the very beginning of the field of movement disorders. So I uh, did some work at that time with him. I went back uh, to Boston, where I spent eight years at uh, what is now the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, and I did clinical neurophysiology and tried to understand movement disorders as, as they were developing. Um, and uh, the field of movement disorders sort of grew up uh, during that period of time. So I became uh, one of the early experts in that that area just by chance to a certain extent because that's the way the field was developing and I had been interested in motor physiology particularly. Um, then um, in 1984 I moved from the Brigham down here and I've been here ever since and uh, I, I had enjoyed my time as a fellow uh, studying membrane biophysics here and learning about movement and uh, having a, a lot of time to do research, and I thought it would be fun to come back again and uh, spend a lot of time doing research in different things and work in the field of movement disorders. But the idea basically of uh, understanding the way the brain works by looking at the motor system, uh, try to understand the principles of motor control, and then to understand patients that have movement disorders and uh, to go back and forth between the two. So if you have 
an understanding of normal physiology, you can help uh, understand then the pathophysiology of patients. And if you understand patients to a certain extent, that helps you understand the normal part. So you can go back and forth between uh, normals and uh, patients in that regard, and then hopefully be able to take some of that information to a way to be useful uh, for the patients so that uh, sometimes clinical trials can evolve from that. So um, uh, we've been interested in a variety of aspects of motor control. How does the brain control movement? Uh, how does the brain learn new skills? Variety of interesting questions that uh, we've been trying to deal with. And um, uh, we've involved ourselves with a number of different types of movement disorders. Uh, we do a lot of work in patients that have dystonia and myoclonus and Tourette syndrome and Parkinson's disease and variety of uh, movement disorder issues of various kinds. Now, um, in uh, doing this, we set up a clinic, or I set up a clinic for patient referrals that might be sent to us uh, uh, of uh, unknown type, uh, you know, just so that we could uh, see these interesting cases to perhaps help out people from the outside, and also to train the fellows that were uh, coming into the group. And uh, let me show you a couple of, uh, so then it became clear to me that there was a class of patients that we didn't understand at all. And uh, let me show you a couple examples uh, of some of these patients. We need the sound. Patient coming in complaining of paroxysmal tremor. tiring, fatiguing type of disorder uh, for her. Uh, uh, these things uh, happen to her all day long. Um, and of course, quite, quite distressing uh, to her. Uh, here's another patient who doesn't have tremor, but has uh, these jerks from time to time that affect her. Um, so she can be... Uh, just sitting and relaxed, and all of a sudden, yeah. these these uh, jerks affect her, and yeah. she can't uh, yeah. she she can't control them. There's there's nothing uh, that's voluntary about this in, in any way. Just uh, these things happen, and uh, it's uh, particularly triggered by uh, sound or other uh, thing that might be a startling. Stimulus and actually, this movement looks like a startle. Uh, so if uh, if you get surprised, you might make a sort of a movement like this. And even if she knows that something is happening, uh, she she has that uh, startle-like movement. And uh, here's a here's another patient. Uh, this is a patient that says that she has difficulty with her balance. Uh, she can't walk well. Um, Having, having difficulty uh, uh, keep walking, on further. frequent falls uh, that are affecting her, and um, lots of Okay, turn lots back, of trouble. back now. Now, uh, you'll see a fall in just a second. Uh, right, so uh, this happens from, from time to time. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, turns out to be interesting in this class of patients which look quite different one to another is that on their neurological examinations they are completely normal. 
uh, there's, there's nothing that one can find that's abnormal about uh, their neurologic exams, their MR scans, and all tests that uh, we can do are also completely normal. There's nothing that uh, can find that's abnormal in this. And uh, none of the movements that uh, are made here, or these uh, funny movements that you see, are uh, in any way different looking from voluntary movements. Uh, in other words, they, these things could all be easily mimicked. And uh, if we look at the physiology of the movement, and we can do that with EEG and MRI and a variety of things, largely it, it looks like a voluntary normal movement. But uh, they uh, say it's not voluntary. This isn't something that, that they're doing. This is something that uh, happens to them, uh, or it's some incoordination that uh, happens to them that, that they uh, are not aware of. And uh, so this, this class of patients, uh, it turned out to be about 30% of the patients that were coming into our clinic. Uh, so uh, that is to say that uh, around the country, uh, when patients would be referred to us for unknown problems, 30% of them uh, had this type of disorder. Now, what is this? So this turns out to be fall into a class of what is now, uh, terminology keeps changing, uh, of uh, what's now called somatic symptom and related disorder. It, this is a psychiatric classification. Um, uh, neurology and psychiatry all have to do with the brain, you know. So this is uh, this happens to be the psychiatric classification for this, and the terminology that is uh, largely the case on almost all these patients is what's called conversion disorder or functional neurological symptom disorder. Now, what's a conversion disorder? A, a conversion disorder turns out to be a Freudian term. Um, the idea of conversion is that uh, uh, if one believes the, the notion is that there is a psychological stressor of some sort or a psychiatric stressor of some sort that is converted into a somatic symptom to relieve the discomfort of the psychological stress. So you could have someone who would be very depressed uh, and they convert the depression into a tremor. So now they have the tremor, but they get rid of their depression. That would be a conversion. Now that was the idea of, uh, of Freud's in this regard. Uh, and uh, this terminology has stuck, although the, uh, whether Freud uh, is right in this regard uh, has not ever been established, of course. Uh, and these days, Freudian uh, psychology is not, doesn't have a particularly good name. Uh, people have uh, said, yeah, if, that was uh, old time stuff, and it is not the way the brain works. Um, uh, so we have to understand this. So there are a couple reasons that, therefore, we got interested in this particular class. First of all, there were a lot of these patients. Uh, second, it turned out that no one was studying them. And third, it had a fascinating, to me, aspect about motor physiology in that here are all these movements that look voluntary, but the patients say they're involuntary. And that raises the question is, what makes a movement voluntary? Uh, what is the essence of brain physiology that makes something voluntary? So there are a number of reasons to get interested in these cases. Let me just tell you a little bit more about them. Uh, we were seeing 30%, as I uh, said, but if you look at uh, just almost anybody's neurology clinic, it's about 10% of patients that, that come. Uh, if you look at any cardiology practice, any GI practice, all, almost everybody in every field of medicine, about 10%, of patients have uh, somatic disorders of, of various kinds. So this is not rare, but it has been co almost completely neglected. In terms of cost, uh, there is this relatively uh, 
recent study, I guess is what, about five years ago, uh, looking at patients with somatization as opposed to patients who have organic disorders of various kinds. And patients with somatization come and uh, utilize twice as much medical care as uh, other individuals. It's part because no one understands them and they keep coming back they, uh, with all these symptoms. So 16% uh, of the US healthcare expenditure is spent on these patients. Um, and uh, there's probably, or has, there was virtually no one looking at these cases. It turned out that both neurology textbooks and psychiatry textbooks had dropped this entity completely. And if you talk, I uh, talked to psychiatry residents, they said, oh yeah, somatization, that used to occur in Freud's time, but it's, it's, it's a disorder that's disappeared. And it disappeared for psychiatrists because only neurologists were seeing the patients, or only gastroenterologists or cardiologists, the psychiatrists weren't seeing them. And the neurologists and the cardiologists were not interested in them. They thought it was a psychiatric problem. So the patients completely dropped out of, out of interest. And in terms of disability, is a, just to sort of point out, this is not a minor problem for the patients. This is a study comparing patients with Parkinson's disease and uh, what's here called psychogenic movement disorders. It's an equal amount of disability, equal amount of physical health problems, uh, worse mental health, uh, more distress, more anxiety, more depression uh, in these patients than patients with Parkinson's disease. So this is a bad problem, uh, common problem, and uh, we thought it would be worthwhile uh, looking at these, at these cases. Now, I've, uh, uh, so we have been doing a whole variety of studies, and uh, I'm nearing the my end here. I got a, someone was waving at me. Am I supposed to stop soon? <laughs> I will. So uh, I'll just show you one of our physiological studies uh, on, these, on these patients. And that is that um, uh, this is a uh, MRI study in uh, which we uh, uh, had people in an MR scanner and uh, we showed them pictures of faces. There were faces like this that were fearful, faces like this that were happy. We asked the people to respond to whether it was a male or a female face. Uh, that was what they were doing. They weren't paying attention to the expression. They were paying attention to whether it was male or female. That's what we asked them to do. Uh, and uh, however, we weren't interested in that. We were interested in what their brain was reacting to the fear or the happy face. And in doing that, uh, we found, and we compared this in patients with uh, conversion disorder and those uh, and uh, normal individuals, and we found an increase activity in the right amygdala in patients with this particular type of disorder. Um, more to happy faces, uh, there is a greater difference in happy faces, but also in fearful faces in the patients. So the amygdala is overactive. Uh, in patients with uh, functional movement disorders. And the amygdala is one of the centerpieces of the limbic system, which is the emotional place in the brain, uh, the sort of center of emotion. So here you have uh, the sort of Freudian idea on the one hand of a psychological symptom being converted to a somatic symptom, and here we have in these patients uh, overactivity of the limbic system, which is the emotional part of the brain, which may then drive the motor system uh, in some abnormal way. So it could well be that uh, to some extent this is uh, uh, the uh, way of the, the physiology uh, underlying uh, the basic Freudian conception uh, from the beginning. So uh, while <clears throat> I'm certainly not Freud, uh, it is sort of interesting to me that I began with an interest in uh, Freud in high school, and here I am, a neurologist, <laughs> studying this particular group of patients. It's a, bit, uh, it's a bit funny, isn't it, in a way? And this just appeared in the New York Times Magazine 
which I thought was sort of fitting in this regard. Uh, tell it about your mother. Can brain scanning help save Freudian psychoanalysis? Well, maybe it can. <laughs> we'll have to see. In any event, um, uh, I, I hope this uh, gives you some uh, notion about how uh, these interesting ideas and interesting people that, uh, that one sees can influence your career, and I hope that uh, you'll also be interested in this important problem of conversion disorder and uh, try to help us figure it out. So thank you very much. How did I find the opportunity? Yeah, so um, yeah, it, uh, so the way that I had the opportunity to go to London, um, so, I, so I went to Harvard Medical School, and uh, Harvard Medical School has a traveling fellowship, which I applied for and got. Uh, so uh, the fellowship was given to me, and I could then choose where I wanted to go. It made it uh, relatively easy in that case, once I got the fellowship. <laughs> uh, they, uh, uh, yes, fortunately for me, ordinarily they were giving one a year, but this year they gave, that year they gave two. So even if I had been in second place, I <laughs> would, have, would have gotten it. But that's how I, that's, that's the way I finance that uh, fellowship. All right, I'll be back later for the panel discussion. So have a good rest of the day, and I'll see you all later. <laughs>